Welcome everyone to the Voice of Meaning. This is a very, very special day and um, a special moment that we are able to meet Professor Maria Marshall. She's going to be talking to us from Ottawa, Canada, and she has a very, very interesting life and very relevant to today. Um, what What is it that you're a professor of, Maria? I am, uh, well, first of all, hello, and thank you very much for having me. I want to greet all the listeners and those who are viewing this program, and uh, uh, very warm-heartedly welcome you to this very uh, special to me as well presentation to and to have the opportunity to talk about myself a little bit in the context of logotherapy. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a professor of uh, logotherapy and spirituality uh, at the Graduate Theological Foundation. Their headquarters are now in Florida, Sarasota, Florida, and uh, I'm professor of logotherapy, teaching logotherapy courses. I'm the Minion Eisenberg Professor of Logotherapy and Spirituality there. Wonderful. Well, a lot of people don't know what logotherapy is. In just a few words, can you describe it? Logotherapy as a founded as uh, developed by Professor Dr. Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist, is a humanistic existentialist orientation to psychotherapy. It has wide applications in medicine, psychiatry, and the helping professions. Its basic foundations are laid on a, a view of the human person, an understanding of the human person as a three-dimensional entity an entity of body, mind, and spirit. And that our main motivation in life is not the search of power or the search of pleasure, but the search for meaning. The search for meaning that resonates. That's mm -hmm. basically the reason why we call this YouTube channel the voice of meaning. We like to talk to people who are doing meaningful things, living meaningful lives, and discovering meaning, very, very important. Mm -hmm. I happen to know that you are a wife and a mother of five very active, all now teenage boys. How are you able to apply this search for meaning to your everyday family life? Oh, so, uh, well, at home, we have a very interesting and dynamic way of living. So my husband, Edward, and myself are the directors of the Ottawa Institute of Logotherapy, and we share the workload. So while Edward is working, uh, I'm usually in the background supporting. And of course, uh, we both participate in raising our children. Ever since the children were small, I would not say that there was a, maybe a day in our lives that we were not mindful of one or the other of logotherapeutic principles. And that is because it basically permeates our lives, it permeates our way of doing things, our way of being. It is not something that would be alien to many people who are of goodwill, who are in for compassion, for kindness, for generosity, for understanding and who uh, understand that meaning itself does not protect us from suffering. So we do face suffering. And we see that in the lives of the children as well as in our own lives. So just because we are logotherapists or knowledgeable about logotherapy, it does not mean that we don't go through challenges. We go through challenges on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, monthly, yearly basis. And we have witnessed that ever since our children were born, ever since they were little. Um, some of them have um, special challenges related to their health. Um, of course, they become ill. Two of our children were diagnosed with type one diabetes. So we always, whenever we care for them, whenever we, as we extend our skills in the areas of medicine or psychology, we are very much aware that we are three dimensional. So behind the mask of any illness, an illness is what we have. An illness is what affects our bodies. It may even affect our minds. It may affect uh, the way in which we are able to express ourselves, 
But behind that mask of the disease, behind the vulnerability, behind the finiteness, behind being ill, there is an intact spirit, which is the essence of the person. And we aim to encourage and to kindle uh, the will to meaning in that spirit, the will, hope. In other words, hope. And to see every person beginning with our children as not really belonging to us, but belonging to life. And as being the servants who are encouraging their abilities and capacities and healing their bodies and minds and enabling them to function as best as possible and to develop to their full capacity in order to be good vehicles, good instruments of the spirit which belongs to life and obeys the voice of meaning and needs to gradually learn how to listen to their voice of conscience in the decisions that they make. That's that, how we see our responsibility as parents. That's, that, that's wonderful. So the spirit is one of the three dimensions, is that correct? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, what are the other two dimensions? Mind the other and, two yeah. are body and mind. Of course, this is not very different from what most of the listeners would be familiar with. I uh, sometimes use my fingers and I say body, mind, and spirit. So it's like three-dimensional. Body is what we have, what we can see, touch, measure. It is vulnerable, finite. Um, it is something uh, that we can use to accomplish meaning. It's through our bodies that we bring into the world something that is meaningful. Our mind is what in Viktor Frankl's theory is um, what is guiding our actions, is our capacity to think, to feel, uh, capacity for our memories, our uh, thoughts, uh, sensations, all belong to the capacity of the mind through brain function. But since we have so many billion neurons, uh, the human being is qualitatively capable of more than any plant or animal, which also possesses body and mind to different degrees. So in the evolution of humanity, human beings are qualitatively in a distinct category from any animal, even though according to a biological distinction, we belong to the family of, of animals. So the homo sapiens, the intelligent human beings, right? Biologically, we could be categorized, but qualitatively, we could we are way different in a way that our mind is capable of self-reflection. And beyond that, through our spirit, through our essence, through what we really are, we are capable of even distancing from ourselves, capable of reaching out to others, capable of reaching out toward meaning. Now, the dimension of spirit needs to be elaborated on a little bit. Maybe uh, I could explain a little bit Please. what it means, uh, the dimension of spirit. So what we mean by the spirit. So the spirit is something that is we, we are unable to touch, unable to measure, as we said, and in Viktor Frankl's theory, the real essence of the person, who we are. Body and mind is what we have, which can become ill, vulnerable. Spirit is who we are, who is always healthy. The dynamics of the human spirit is to always reach beyond the self toward meaning. And here the concept of meaning comes in, of what is meant by meaning. Meaning is a value that stands in relation to a person. And this is um, a, a super, uh, a super um, it's, it's not a... Uh, not something that is determined, is not something that can be uh, ordered for a person, but a value that stands in relation to a person. It is a value that stands in relation, that is transcendent, is beyond a person's here and now, is something that is awaiting a person, is something that is waiting for a person to be accomplished. The reality of a value standing in relation to a person. So that is what is meant. A spirit is always reaching out toward that what is meant by life. Life is always questioning us, addressing us directly at any moment. Like right now in this moment, right? The value that stands is like a universe of stars. The value that stands closest to me, the brightest in this moment is 
to strive with all my cognitive functions and with my biological functions enabling it to give a good presentation that is intelligible and understandable as much as possible, right? So I subordinate my speech, my thought, my feelings. I try to shut out everything else and focus on the right now. And I'm dedicating myself to this value. This value right now is a creative value. I'm bringing into the world something that did not exist before. This presentation, we are just recording it right now. It was not there before. My words were not there before. And now they are becoming reality. So my spirit is guiding me. I'm listening to my voice of conscience, which is one of my resources in my spirit, that is telling me, try to do your best. If you are not the best, try to just live up to your standards as best as possible. You make mistakes, not the end of the world. The meaning is what matters. The message is what matters. Trust that your audience will be able to be carried by that meaning. When you do your best, your audience will be able to follow. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the resources of the spirit, other Please. resources of the spirit. So, and because we have limited time, I'm just going to mention them because they are different from just mental abilities. So uh, love beyond the physical, being with another person in spirit. Spirit is not limited to time and space. So when I think of my sister who lives on the other end of this continent in Vancouver, I can in my spirit transport myself to there and touch her with my love in my thoughts, but with my spirit and feel very close to her, connected with her. So love beyond the physical, being with another person. Uh, forgiveness, gratitude, thankfulness, imagination, intuition, faith. These are just some of the resources of the spirit that are in the medicine, medicine chest of the person, even when they are very ill. It is something that cannot be taken away from a person. And when they are very ill, um, there is only just a mask that is covering this ability maybe up temporarily. So when we provide medical interventions, when we provide psychotherapy, we enable the mind and the body again to become instruments of the spirit and the spirit to shine forth. But the value and the dignity of the person is always linked with who they are in spirit is unconditional and inalienable and is the essence and part and who the person is. It cannot be taken away from a person. Thank you. That gives me goosebumps. It's a wonderful <laughs> explanation of spirit, the idea that we can be with our loved ones through space and time, even loved ones that are no longer alive. That's exactly that that's wonderful and that's significant yes yes but we don't want to ignore the fact that today is international holocaust remembrance day i happen to know maria that that you lost a, a few dozen ancestors in the holocaust so it hits home you talked about victor frankl who was um incarcerated in concentration camps and and wrote the book man's search for meaning that described that um that's and my question and and i'd like you to talk a little bit of first of all about that history and the second part of my question is we're living in troubled times both politically there's a lot of fighting a lot of death and suffering going on how do we find meaning through all of that mm -hmm. Oh, Neil, as they say, this is a loaded question. You're asking loaded questions because there is a lot to say. Maybe I will start with the first part of the question and then bridge over to the second because they very nicely connect. Uh, but it is a story. And I must say that I did not know about this story until some time ago. And this is not a story that one knows once and for all, this part of the family history, but one discovers it, one discovers a bit more, one discovers it through family conversations, bits and pieces, and then one lives a bit more and one understands and one deepens in one's understanding. One relates to it and one lives it and one is able to at some point distance from it and observe it and one is able to capture it in words. Uh, 
But there were times when for me, there were only sensations, feelings, vague memories, vague feelings, and no comprehension, not much understanding. So my first understanding was that um, my great grandparents who were, now this is a very much a cliche, they were decorated by the emperor, like in the sound of music, they were decorated by the emperor. So um, my great grandfather was a participant of the first world war and he was decorated. And uh, they also had a nobility title from the Austro-Hungarian empire. This nobility title still exists to this day with all its rights and privileges. It is safely kept in my family. So there is a stamp and there is a document. This is where my journey started. My parents showed me the stamp and the document without saying much about the people who it pertained to. And then we read the text that it said it pertains to all the descendants and all the relations of the family. Then we asked more because I did not know much about my grandparents and I like to spend time in the kitchen of my grandmother. My grandmother, while she was cooking and she was preparing these wonderful meals, she loved to talk. And she said, don't pull my tongue because then there is a story coming and let me tell you. So my grandmother told me that during the second world war, um, my great grandfather was taken to Auschwitz, but she just said to the concentration camps, um, then there were some versions of the story in which my great grandfather had been shot on the estate, so he never made it to Auschwitz. Later, I found out that his mother, a 98-year-old great-great-grandmother to me, also was loaded onto the cattle cars toward Auschwitz, but made it only to a few stops, and then her body was thrown off the wagon. We know the location in Hungary where this, where this happened, but there is only a ditch there. No memorial stands there, and there are no graves. Similarly, to my great-great-grandfather, there is no great-great-grandfather. Uh, there is no memorial. There is only mentioning in Yad Vashem, where the documents were filled. So, as I mentioned, I had to piece together the story and ask my parents, what is it that they know? Um, then my parents shared with me that, yes, it was Auschwitz. And when I heard this, I had goosebumps. Auschwitz. I... I I did not realize my great-grandfather was in Auschwitz. My great-grandfather, and then to this day, I'm looking at pictures where they, these famous pictures where they show Hungarians disembarking from the train, Hungarians arriving at Auschwitz. I'm asking myself, would I be able to recognize my great-grandfather there? Would he be there because he would have been there somewhere? So apparently what happened is that uh, the guards then started to, after this opening of one of the cattle cars and the Hungarian prisoners disembarking, one of the Nazi guards started to savagely beat up uh, a fellow prisoner who he knew, a fellow inmate, and, um, um, and the guard just shot him. So that's what happened in Auschwitz. In the meanwhile, my grandfather was taken to a work camp this work camp, we do not know exactly where it was located because my grandmother would not tell us. But I know for a fact that there is correspondence from this work camp, uh, from this forced labor camp that came regularly for some time to my grandmother. So they were able to correspond and my grandmother was on from time to time able to even prepare a package. I know that the task of my grandfather was to use an ax pickaxe and to dig trenches. Other times they were forced to look for uh, hidden landmines close to the front. I know that the chances of survival according to estimates were sometimes worse than in the concentration camps. So my grandfather by some miracle was able to escape from this camp. It was toward the end of the war and walking barefoot arrive home. By this time my father was born and he was two years old when my grandfather arrived home. My grandfather, as I understand from my grandmother, was devoid of any feelings, unable to express emotion of joy, of happiness. Uh, he looked at his son, uh, turned to a companion and said, um, what do you think, is he nice? And uh, my grandfather was not the same man 
who, who left, then who left. My grandfather was not talking about his experiences in the work camps. I once participated in a meeting of psychologists and um, I shared this bit of peace because uh, um, all of a sudden the group session, which was um, a psychodrama session, and without my knowledge, I participated in this absolutely as a university student, not knowing what to expect. All of a sudden, the group leader had this idea of, well, let's play a role play that one of you is going to be a prison guard and another a prisoner and let's see the dynamics. And I was shaking in my seat. I became red and I was shaking and I didn't know why. <laughs> and uh, later I, I shared with the group leader after the meeting was over that um, uh, my grandfather had been in a work camp and I have a, a very intense uh, reaction to this, uh, what happened. And I don't understand why he didn't share with us uh, the, any details. And she said, maybe it was because um, it was to protect you from these details. But I, you know, as every person, I was curious, <laughs> curious, curious, and nothing could stop my curiosity. So I wanted to learn more and I wanted to know more, even though at that time, and I know that many of the descendants maybe can relate to, at some point there are intense feelings of pain, intense feelings of pain as one um, with, through empathy relives the experience and tries to relate to the experience. And of course, to any human being, um, reading about these experiences, if one has a bit of decency, a, a bit of feeling, one feels the pain of the other, one feels the cruelty. And when one feels that on one's own skin, it's like as if in a previous life I have felt that, um, pardon for the expression, but as if I had felt this somewhere. And um, then comes the logotherapeutic part of what one does with this, what good one turns this to. What is the meaning of all this? What was this suffering good for? So here comes a way of then putting all the pieces together, understanding what happened. And this came to me through reading Man's Search for Meaning when I was 16 years old in German, because I was in Germany at that time, and I wanted to learn the German language, thinking that one day from Hungary, northern part of Serbia, where we lived as a Hungarian minority with a Jewish and Christian background, that we would be able to emigrate. So learning the German language was very important. Uh, I'm the oldest of seven children. So I was the, uh, you know, the, the one who would explore the grounds. How, how do they call that? Uh, the explorer, uh, the pioneer, <laughs> the, the trailblazer. So I learned German for my life, thinking that I will go to university. And I read Man's Search for Meaning, and uh, tears started to uh, just uh, flow down my cheeks as I, every sentence seemed to speak to me. And the message that I took away was that no matter, this is beautifully expressed in, in Dr. Franco's book, Man's Search for Meaning, no matter what circumstances you subject a human being to, you can never break or take away the defined power of the human spirit their spirit. Their spirit lives on. And so especially knowing the circumstances of my great grandfather's death, knowing the life of my grandfather, knowing that my child, was, uh, my, my father was a hidden child, um, give me a sense of, uh, of purpose, a sense of direction, that these two shall count. These two shall not be taken away. This two is forever because the suffering that we endured, the suffering that we faced with dignity can never be taken away from the face of this earth and no power of, on earth can rob us of our experiences, especially the suffering that we faced with the right attitude, with the right perspective, with the right disposition. And so this is what I took from the message and this is how I connected it to Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning and to the message of Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Maybe I will stop here for now and ask you, Neil, if you would like to, me to elaborate or, on anything, or I maybe didn't cover any of the question. I or think part you, of the question. I think you covered it very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, so far, I think about 16 million people have read Man's Search for Meaning. And mm -hmm. many people say it was very successful, but 
I believe a couple billion more would benefit from reading it. Oh, and, yes. Yeah. Yes, I, absolutely. I, yes, I uh, believe maybe I uh, mentioned this to you earlier, but when one reads a book, especially a book like Man's Search for Meaning, which belongs to the treasure trove of the history of humanity, it doesn't as much belong to Viktor Frankl, it doesn't belong to you and I, it belongs to the world, it belongs to humanity. When one reads a testimony such as that, the purpose of writing this testimony, as I understand from reading Dr. Frankl's biography, was not so much for his own healing. It was not so much even to document point by point, this happened and then that happened and to have a historical point by point correctness. Some people sometimes tend to misunderstand that. It was not the point. The point was to transmit a message, a legacy of hope. Transmit this legacy that the suffering that we went through bravely and with courage and the legacy of those people who died in the camp and those who survived and carry on that legacy cannot be touched by disease, by the ill will of, of anyone, by evil, by anything that may happen on this earth, it remains. So whatever is meaningful remains and is written forever in human history. And that is a message of hope and encouragement for all of us. I will put the, the title of the book in the um, comments so that people can find it. Um, on more of your career, I understand that um, you and Edward are also psychotherapists and have yes. a clinical mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume you use logotherapy techniques in your practice. Mm -hmm. Do you find it easier to reach your clients using logotherapy? Yes. Uh, so we have been uh, opening, uh, well, we had this practice here in Ottawa, the Ottawa Institute of Logotherapy now for close to 12 years. Uh, we moved from, we had quite a trajectory. So we moved here from Halifax. And wherever we were, we always had an institute and we always had a, a clinic, a private practice. So in Halifax, we had a maritime institute. Prior to that, we were in Vancouver. Uh, then we had a, a small private practice. Prior to that, we were in England together. Uh, we have been married now for uh, 22 years, close to. Uh, there we also worked together and we were thinking of establishing one day an institute. So wherever we were, we always took logotherapy with us. And um, well, the spark of the practice, the beginning of it, the, the alpha of it is, uh, is, a, is an approach, is an, uh, is an orientation uh, to, uh, to our clients, uh, which is manifested, we hope, through our commitment. Through our commitment and through our belief in the power of the human spirit and the will to meaning that we need to encourage and foster. And this will to meaning is going to encourage and fuel the therapeutic alliance and our clients will to improvement and to making a change if it's necessary, to changing themselves if it's required, and to give them a hope and an optimism and a way to go forward that we need to just support with techniques and ways uh, that comes from our knowledge and from our training and from our expertise. So logotherapy gives uh, this beginning and alpha and omega basically is, is uh, uh, an overarching framework for working with people, recognizing the strength of the spirit behind any illness and the hope that is always there to overcome obstacles and to deal with obstacles, no matter what the circumstances may be. I also understand that you studied under um, Elizabeth Lucas mm -hmm. and you, you've met her personally, yes. is that correct? Yes, 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 that's correct, yes. Yeah. Yes, so I, I um, since I was little, I have, had my own introduction to logotherapy through my father. 
uh, my father um, was a psychiatrist in uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia where we lived. And uh, from there, behind uh, the iron curtains of the communist, uh, communist countries, he uh, went to see Dr. Frankl because he wrote his doctoral dissertation on Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. And so he was collaborating with Dr. Frankl as well as with uh, Dr. Lucas, who was uh, at that time uh, already finished with her dissertation and uh, established uh, very soon after that, the first South German Institute of Logotherapy that she was the director. So there was a collaboration between Dr. Frankl and Dr. Lucas and my father. And so as a little child, um, I was taken to see Dr. Frankl, I understand when I was two years old. I do not remember that, but I remember that I was looking at the back of the car from the rear seats because at that time there were no seat belts, uh, at least not in the back that I remember. And I did not have to wear a seat belt. And I was looking to the back, and there was a lot of snow, so it must have been a winter time. We were coming back, and I remember my father talking a lot about. Dr. Frankl, Dr. Lucas, and the mail came in. So I was usually um, in charge of checking the mail and I went there every day and I opened the mailbox and there were books and there were uh, brochures and there were letters. And my father spent uh, his time after work at the dim light. He, after his shifts, um, he came home from the hospital and he said, uh, come, come and stay with me and uh, let's spend a bit of time together. And uh, you can climb on my back and he had uh, Victor Franco's books open and he had a pen and he was underlining and making some notes. And I still have um, some of his books with me. So that was from the 1970s and 1980s. So I grew up with the books of Victor Franco and uh, Dr. Lucas. And so in the 1990s, when we moved to uh, 1991, we moved from uh, my old country to Canada. And then my father asked Dr. Lucas where one could study logotherapy here in North America. And then Dr. Lucas recommended contacting Dr. Barnes, Dr. Robert Barnes in Abilene at the Hardin Simmons University. And uh, I was uh, very privileged because I became a very special student of Dr. Barnes and Dr. Uh, Dr. Robert Barnes and Dr. Uh, uh, Dorothy Barnes, and I was with them for a year and a half, completing my master's degree. At the completion of my master's degree, I uh, came back to Canada and I completed my doctoral degree also on logotherapy, um, just like my father. It had to be just like my father. So my father encouraged me to do that, but in uh, with applications, not in psychiatry, but in uh, psychology, counseling psychology, my specialty. And then I wrote to Dr. Lucas, and I have uh, by that time attended a lot of her conferences and congresses at the international conferences in Dallas, um, thanks to Dr. Barnes, who was organizing them. And so um, I knew Dr. Lucas by then, and we met, and Dr. Lucas said, um, I, um, she wrote to me in German, he said, uh, look, uh, we Europeans, we have very deep philosophical roots. And if you uh, can afford to come here to see me, I would be very um, uh, happy to take you on as my own student, um, tuition free if, if that's necessary. And you would be my own student and you can earn then your diploma here with me, your diploma in logotherapy. And so I studied the diplomate, I completed the diplomate credential with the Victor Frankl Institute in the United States. And then I had an invitation, uh, thanks to Dr. Alexander Vesely, the grandson of Victor Frankl, to come to Vienna to give a presentation. And uh, at the end of my presentation, I uh, went over to Fürsten Feldbruck to see Dr. Lucas and then to study with her. And I was there for about uh, two, two, three weeks. And uh, I uh, attended lectures, presentations, and finished with a final exam. And now it was based on her books and my understanding and my dissertation all put together. But nevertheless, the final exam was still a scary moment for me. <laughs> and so it was, the question was the capacities of the human spirit.
So it was the very answer that I gave just at the beginning of the presentation that Dr. Lucas very patiently listened to me and she corrected me and she gave me additional supporting literature that accompanied me and she gave me at the end many of her own books uh, to take with me everything that I didn't have and she had in print. She said, here is a list, check mark it and it's yours. Take it from the shelf. Everything is there, whatever you choose. And I ended up choosing everything that I could carry with me in the package. And uh, Dr. Lucas uh, was more than a mentor to me. She was uh, a benefactor and uh, a wonderful and gracious person who I could uh, and I would never forget. So for the rest of my life, she promised that uh, ever there would be a need for any clarifications or any help that we would we could work together and uh, I would be free to contact her. And that's how she sent me back to Canada, saying that you are now in the position to understand logotherapy and your mission would be to create a bridge between us, my writings and Viktor Frankl's writings in German, which you can read, and to convey that to our colleagues, convey them your understanding in English. And that would be your mission. And I accepted it and I understood it. And I said, in whatever circumstances I'm going to find myself in, uh, that is going to be my pledge that I'm going to fulfill that mission. That, that's wonderful. So you were like the third generation. Uh, I remember when Dr. Franco was alive, he said that Elizabeth Lucas was the greatest living uh, proponent and interpreter of of logotherapy. And I have no doubt that his love and enthusiasm rubbed off on two-year-old Maria forever more that, that well, life. Yes. yes, you have that. It's just not possible, just not possible not to, because there was uh, this openness, there was this frankness of communication, uh, one felt that one could share, you know, whatever was relevant and that one could gain support and one could communicate. And uh, and she was there. Uh, whenever she uh, we sat down, for example, this is how the last conversation went the, in person with Dr. Lucas. Um, so I, I was quite nervous. I was very nervous. I'm always nervous when I have interviews and important appointments. Who is not? But I am one of those people who gets nervous very easily. So I chose some candles that I thought this will be a wonderful present for Dr. Lucas. And Christmas was very close. So I arrived with my Christmas present and presented to Dr. Lucas. And to my surprise, she's sitting behind a, a wonderful round desk, a round table, a table of, on which the center of it is a candle and she is going to light it. And she says, I'm lighting this candle because can this candle reminds us that this conversation between you and I is not just a conversation of two minds, but there is a conversation between spirits. And when this light is here, it reminds us there is a third element and that element is the element of meaning. And so we are going to keep this candle here lit as long as we uh, have our meeting. And that right away set me at ease. There was a different dimension here because the candle was lit and it kind of reminded me of something that is there and eternal and cannot be taken away, even if I could barely speak any German. And after that, I sometimes I had to shift to English and my English was not very good because it was my second language and I was all getting garbled up and all things. And Dr. Lucas said, um, just simply not to worry about anything. Everything is fine and I am where I should be and I am and I'm doing what I as much as I can do. And there was no uh, extra pressure and there was no extra expectation. And there, and it, it gave me the feeling that I am all right if I do what my conscience tells me to do. And if I do as much as I can, and I am enough, and each and every one of us is enough as we are. And when meaning presents itself, meaning is not given to superhumans or suprahumans. No, we are here, ordinary people, doing something that is sometimes extraordinary. That is with the gift of the spirit, with the help of the spirit, we do it. It is not just out of our strength in body and mind. In fact, many times our body may be vulnerable, susceptible to illness. Our mind may be failing, but that's not the point. The point is to be there. 
The point is to present ourselves to the task that is awaiting us in the moments to come, from moment to moment to moment. And if we manage to accomplish that, then we know that to the, to the greater scheme of life, we have said our yes to life. And that is what matters, to give our unconditional yes to life, no matter what. That's, that's very inspiring. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on the spot because okay. one of the most wonderful things I learned from Dr. Lucas through you mm -hmm. was the candle meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to offer a short, in your words, candle meditation for everyone? Yes. All right. I can do it, but I will have to improvise it without improvise. a live because because of without a lack of a live candle. So I'm going to <laughs> I'm okay. touching this this yellow highlighter. So we're going to use this instead of a real candle. All Please. right. So yes. So we are going to think of this highlighter as a candle. And if I had known, I would have um, you know, brought a candle and lit it, but it doesn't matter because we have imagination and we are going to imagine that this stands for a candle. So first of all, looking at our candle, the first step is to observe our candle. We all have a candle somewhere in the house right now, somewhere, even if because we just need to worry about um, the winter being so cold and what happens if there are power cuts. So there is a candle somewhere lying in a drawer, somewhere under maybe... Um, you know, re remaining from Christmas time somewhere or from a special celebration or from a birthday cake. We all have a candle somewhere. So if we just take our candle and we carefully observe it, what do we see from the outside? We see the wick on the inside, which is the essence linking a clump of wax. The clump of wax stands, stands for what we have, the instruments. <clears throat> and the wick as well, right now, is still just an instrument. So it represents our body, mind. When we light the wick, it, we turn function into purpose. Right now in time, we have brought something into reality that was not there before. The function, the wick, lighting the wick, turns into something that was not there before. And it gives light a beautiful light that can help others to see in the darkness, that can help celebrate, that can help change the mood, that can help light up the darkness and change the dark into day. A little light, a little light of our own. So that candle represents the light that we can be to the world, that we can give to the world. The function, the, the week, turn now into light. It is fulfilling its purpose. Inside, as we see the wax, the, the, as the little light is glowing and glowing and glowing, the wax is melting. The wax is melting and sometimes it's pouring on the side of the candle. And that's how it is in life. We cannot turn the time back. However, the time flows into the past. What we have accomplished, what we have done, what we merited, but we have done good, true, and beautiful. No one can erase, no one can take away from us. And the wax slowly flows on the sides and we become a little bit weaker maybe, a little bit older, and we have a bit more wrinkles and our voice is not so strong or maybe our muscles are not as strong as they used to be. But that is the sign that we have used up our resources turning what was there, we put the function into purpose. All that was used for something, turned into a good use. And remember, the good will remain. Whatever was not successful, whatever we felt short, we can always reflect back on that and see, is there something still to correct? Is there something still to add? Is there something still to mold? But whatever is good, whatever is beautiful and true, will never pass away. No power on earth can rob that. It will remain and we can look back at it with pride. That is what we can place as if it was on the top of our mountain ranges. And Dr. Lucas said, everything that was not meaningful will pass away. It will become nothing. 
But what was meaningful, that will remain. That is who we are. That is the essence of us. So function was turned into purpose and it gave light. Now imagine that we are all as human beings going through suffering and pain. Because there is one reality in this world and that is that no one is spared from suffering. This little minor and greater suffering that can confront us any time of our lives. Sometimes it doesn't come from some time for some time, but sometimes it comes and the intensity varies. And this Dr. Lucas said we could illustrate that there are little scratches over time on our candle. Scratches, little wounds here and there and there. And sometimes maybe if we blow out the candle just for a moment, pretend, okay, we blew it out, we could snap the candle in half, saying that for some people, it is to the point that suffering, then their body and mind seems like broken. But we do not talk about a broken person in logotherapy. The weak, the essence is still intact. And if we carefully piece the pieces together, even the broken candle, we light it again, can give light. So there is no broken person, according to Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Our bodies and minds can be affected by illness, but we as a person are intact and we can still give light. And now let me share you a little wisdom and a little secret. Whenever we suffer, whenever we are put in a place of pain, that kind of pain, we may not be able to completely avoid. And that's when we are talking about unavoidable suffering. Of course, suffering that can be avoided, we try to alleviate to avoid as much as possible because otherwise it would be masochism. It would not make sense. But that part of pain that we cannot take away, that is not possible to alleviate. That part of suffering we can only overcome and we can only transcend through our attitude, through the disposition we take toward it. And then we show ourselves greater than that suffering. And when we are able through that suffering to gain strength and help another person, then life put us into a position because of that pain to be in a unique position like no one else to understand that kind of pain that we have been through and what we have witnessed. That is not the same as reading in a textbook. That is not the same as listening to stories because we know it from our own experience. We have been there. We know it and we know what helps and we know what helped us to overcome it. When we are able to transmit that in a meaningful way, we are able to relate to the suffering of another. We are able to embrace the other through a special grace that life gave to us and to no one else. No one else the same way. Exactly because of the pain, this unavoidable part of the pain that was given to us. And that is a source of gratitude. And that is a source of a great dignity of people who are suffering and people who may be there lying restless and hopeless and suffering that one day they will be able to carry the torch and give it to someone else who will be able to take it from them just because they have this unique torch to give because of what life gave to them as a special gift that was not given to someone else. So let's go back to the thought of the candle being broken and put together and still being able to give light. So a broken candle can still give light. And when we blow out the light, symbolically, when life ends, and no one anymore sees the candle. The warmth is still there. Can we say that the reality of the candle was not there? No, no one can deny the candle was there. The warmth will still be there. Even if we take the candle, we put it in another room, we close the door, we no longer able to see the candle. Re the reality of the candle remains. So whatever was, is, it is a paradox, it sounds paradoxical. Whatever was, remains. Whatever is past, is. 
whatever is past remains and no one can take it away, even if memory fades and even if memory can no longer recall. And since being today, the remembrance of Holocaust Day, let me just maybe end this meditation with a thought that the legacy of those who passed away can similarly remains. And even the passing of memory can never annihilate it or take it away. It remains. So thank you very much for being able to share this meditation thank with you. Thank you for sharing the light of your candle. What a wonderful thought that we're probably, we've had you here for quite a while. And hopefully one person out there will watch this and read Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. And if they want more information, I'm going to put the uh, URL for the Ottawa Institute. They, there's mm -hmm. a wealth of information they can access mm -hmm. there. Also mm -hmm. other resources uh, for people. And, um, and all I can say, Maria, that your candle is an absolute torch lighting so many things. And I appreciate you taking all the time that you have. Do you have any parting thoughts or closing thoughts, not parting? Thoughts? Closing thoughts is that I'm remembering one thing. First of all, I wanted to thank you for your compliment because it means a lot to me. And I'm honored to be here. There is one closing thought that I had in my mind. I did not address yet when you said hope for humanity amidst all the, all the strife and the war. And maybe just one closing thought. Um, and it's a Viktor Frankl uh, line. It's from Viktor Frankl's books that when we take people as they are, we can make them worse. But if we take them as they can be, as they could be, and we, we treat them as their best, we help them to become who they were meant to become. We help them to become their best. And this is where I see hope for the future, to see the other, to be with the other, to know about the pain of the other. Many times we are distanced. Many times we feel that we are far away. We may be far away in miles, but not in spirit. And the hope in the eyes of the children and the eyes of those people who are of goodwill keeps living on and it motivates all of us toward universal values under which this umbrella under which all of our actions retain their sense their meaning and they again sense they gain their sense toward truth beauty and goodness promoting the goodness of the person the dignity and the value of human life no action that doesn't conform to these universal values can be ever meaningful. It can be purposeful, highly organized, very goal directed, but not meaningful. And so we need to strive to listen to that faint, ever faint voice of conscience that always directs us to these universal values, the value of the person, the dignity of the person, the value of each and every human life. And that is hope for the future the refinement of our ability as a human family to listen to our voice of conscience and advance step by step in hope and faith toward embracing our human family. Thank you so, so, so much. I hope someday that you can come on again, maybe together with Edward. Edward was my wife's teacher for her um, mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, studies and mm. I sat in on the classes and they were wonderful mm. and uh, regards to him and the rest of your family thank you so 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 much thank you very much and thank you to all our listeners and viewers thank you from the bottom of my heart <laughs>